Hi, welcome to Bexhill West. I'm James. Now I must confess I have a problem. But before we get to the solution, first we need to talk about window frames and how we go from this to this. Stay tuned. Before we look at the window frames for Bexhill West, let's first consider a couple of examples. The first is a model of an Austrian ski chalet. The second, number one signal box from Bexhill West. Let's take a close look at this wall panel and see how the windows have been made. If we look closely, the wall itself is made of two pieces of material glued together. If we look at the outer skin, square holes have been cut, which represent the window reveals. And if we turn it over, the glazing bars of the windows are cut on the inner panel. So that, when we look from the front, we can paint that inner panel up and it looks like a separately fitted window frame. This second example shows the number one signal box from my Bexhill West project. And if we look closely, we can see that the windows are more or less flush with the brickwork. There's no reveal, if you like. Now, in this case, these are much simpler. The wall material is single skin, and I've simply created a hole and laser cut a frame to go in it. Unfortunately, with the laser cutting, we can get the tolerances just right so that that pops straight in. Now, this isn't the final windows. These are the, the glazing bars are far too wide and out of scale, but it serves the purpose. We can see what's what. At Bexhill West, the sliding sash windows sit in quite a deep reveal and they're set in a heavy wooden frame. So I was really keen to achieve all of that sort of detail. So unlike my chalet example, where the window was really quite basic, I was very keen to incorporate the detail, and make it look as though the different uh, sashes could move. They don't, but it'd be nice if it looked as though the system would work. So how is that done? Well, I've used two thin pieces of MDF. Out of one, I've cut the opening or the, the glass panel of the top sash, and I've cut out the profile into which that top slash would slide if it were a, a real window. Now on the reverse, the opposite is the case. So on the reverse, we just have what would be the glass and then the opening into which that glass would slide if it were a real window. Now, when that's popped into position, we get the illusion of the frame existing and of those sashes being separate pieces. Computer-aided design is really helpful as a tool when laying this sort of work out. And it's a tool that can be really useful, even if you don't have access to a laser cutter. For example, these two layers of material which I built up to create the window, I could have printed those designs on my printer at home, stuck those to a piece of MDF or plastic art or whatever material it was that I intended to use, and then just run around my printed lines with a scalpel and cut these out. So. This computer aided design is not only for those who have access to a laser cutter or a 3D printer, it can still be useful for creating templates for, for those who work with more traditional methods. Now I realised in the edit of this sequence that I've just shown windows from two separate parts of the building, so I'll just jump back to this one. This was the first one I showed you in position, and I mentioned it had a heavy wooden frame. So the frame has been cut separately and so this piece is actually three thicknesses of material 
laminated up to create the shape. Now you'll see I've got four mysterious holes here. We'll come on to those in just a minute. One of the great things also about computer aided design and, and laser cutting is that it gives me the opportunity to engrave some detail on the inside. Now I've decided the inside of the building is not going to be beautifully detailed. I'm not going to go to town with that. But I do want to include some of the detail. So when you look through the window, it at least looks as though I've made an effort. Something worth mentioning is that from the inside, this effect looks a little bit unfinished. So to show how we'd overcome that, I'm going to use my Bodium Station example. Now I know Bodium Station was actually cladded corrugated iron, but it doesn't matter for the purposes of this. This is just my mock-up. I'm playing with some ideas. If we have a look inside, in fact, if I remove the wall, we could see the same thing. I hope the camera will focus on that. The effect is not very good. It looks a little bit unfinished. However, if we attach a frame over that opening, we can get a really good effect. So if I show you on this wall here, this is an outer wall, but the effect will be the same. We get this in focus. I hope you can see that to my eye, at least, that really does look like two separate chassis, uh, two separate sashes. I can't say it. Two separate sashes in the frame. Sorry about that. <laughs> when I started the Bexhill West project, I treated myself to a school's glass engine, knowing that all stations would need a nice train parked outside them. This fixed the era of the model as the late 1950s, and so I was going to need lots of these. And this is at the root of my problem I mentioned earlier. Because since starting the project, I've decided that really, I absolutely need one of these, and maybe one of these, and possibly a couple of these. Which is going to mean an awful lot of these. So the problem is, how can I make my station suitable for the different eras of locomotives and trains that I'd like to display in it? My solution to the problem comes back to these holes that I showed you earlier on. You see, in each of these holes, I glued a small rare earth magnet. And each poster board has similar magnets attached. So the poster board is completely removable. And when the wall panel is inserted, The poster board holds itself on and none of the magnets are visible. So by making my walls in this manner, not only are the poster boards replaceable, but because of the tight tolerances I've achieved with cutting these pieces out, they literally just push in. I can now make alternative walls. So in the pre-grouping days when these window frames were a different colour, I can just have a separate piece painted the correct colour and I can insert those inner wall sections and I can do the same for the outside and eventually I'll get around to painting the insides in the, the different colours that would have been used at the various eras in which I might like to display the model. If I remove this wall You'll see that I've included magnets or holes for magnets everywhere where a sign was attached to the real building. And one of the joys of going and looking at the real building is that the screw holes are all still in the walls exactly where the poster boards were. So I can get them more or less in exactly the right place. There we go, piece of cake. 
So finally, just to wrap this up, this idea seems to work quite well. There is a slight disadvantage in that if we're a little bit clumsy when we fit these, it is possible to stick them on a, a little bit of a wonky angle, but well, there's no trouble, whoops, no trouble to sort that out. We can even fit them upside down if we want. No doubt there'll be a closing photo in a forthcoming video where I do just that to see if anyone's watching. Um, finally, if we look at the sign, we can see it's not centred on this piece of brick wall to which it's attached. And there's a very good reason for that. And that's because just to the left of this one here, in real life, there is a, a vent pipe that goes to the sewer system. And on the right hand side, there's a rainwater downpipe from the, the guttering. So when they're fitted, the signs will, will look to be in the right locations. Well, I hope you found those ideas useful. Maybe they've given you some food for thought. Over the next few videos, I'll show some more details like those where I've used computer-aided design to solve a problem before getting into a series on computer-aided design for absolute beginners. So until next time, take care everyone. Bye-bye.